Hi everyone, welcome back to Dog Q&A. This is number 49 and the fourth of our series with Dr. Jesse McClure talking about separation anxiety in dogs. So the first week we had, um, he talked about separation anxiety versus fear of missing out, the, important of a, the importance of addressing underlying issues and that there is hope for change in all dogs. Um, in the second video, he talked about how to best determine whether or not your dog is displaying separation anxiety and the importance of collecting data on your dog to figure that out. And then he, last week, he talked about the treatment of separation anxiety issues. So today, we're going to discuss how you can set up your environment to prepare your dog for your departure as we go back to work after the lockdown and the pandemic and doing mock departures and what we can expect when leaving our dogs alone now. <laughs> All right, Jesse, how are you doing? <laughs> Good, how about you? Great. All right, take it away. Uh, okay, so I think we wanted to talk about setting up the environment. Uh, so when, we, when you think about a dog with separation anxiety, we need to look at things from, from their point of view and how when we leave, our departure might be a stressor for them, but that might cause them a lot of discomfort, but also a lot of things, a lot of other aspects of the environment often change. I think we alluded to this in a previous video talking about uh, there are suggestions out there that uh, when you leave your dog alone, you should turn on the TV or turn on music. And that's not always the right idea. Now, if you are somebody who has music or TV on while you're home, then yes, leave it on while you're away. But if the, excuse me, if the house is usually quiet while you're home, then having it similarly quiet while you're away will be best. So the idea is not to distract them, but to give them, to give the dog as much consistency in the environment as possible. So the environment that they're left in is very similar to the environment as when you're there. Uh, now, you can use that idea quite deliberately to, to prepare your dog a little bit or to kind of buffer them a little bit against the challenges of separation. Uh, and you can do that by, uh, instead of a mock separation where you actually leave, just set up their, their home environment and practice, uh, I don't want to say ignoring them, but practice being present with them without much interaction. So maybe that would be, especially nowadays with a lot of us, working at home remotely, having Zoom meetings. We will be home, but we will be occupied. And helping your dog be occupied at the same time, whether that's even just sleeping in their bed or wherever they are, prepare them, sorry, let me say that differently, set that up so that their conditions are very similar to what they will be like when you're gone. Mm -hmm. So for, here's a, a, an example. Uh, if you crate your dog while you're gone, crate your dog while you're at home on your Zoom meetings for a while. Uh, and refer back to the previous videos about crating. That's not always helpful for separation anxiety. Sometimes it's actually quite problematic. But if your dog is comfortable in the crate and that's where they're going to be when you're gone, have them crated for a while while you're home and, and doing your own thing. Uh, I mentioned music. Uh, if they're going to be, if you keep your, similar to the crate, if you keep your dog in a certain part of the home while you're gone, Keep them there while you're home for a little while for these kind of practice runs. And you can actually incorporate the idea of desensitization, which was kind of one of the major themes from last week or last bit, the previous video, is the, in a nutshell, you can consider desensitization as taking baby steps towards the goal. So if your dog uh, is, is, is going to be in a certain room in the house when you're away, uh, uh, perhaps you could put a baby gate or some something like that on the door to that room while you're still there. So they get, you know, it's a step towards that goal. Uh, so you gradually remove yourself from the situation. So maybe you'll be farther and farther away from that room. Uh, this all really depends on your environment and in your home. I have a very small home, so there's not a lot that I can do there. But if you have a larger home, your dog is in one area, you're in the next area. And that's practice that you practice that for a few days. Then your dog is in their area. You're a little further away and a little further away. So you're still there. And if they really are really uncomfortable, they can come find you or you'll know immediately if they're whining, but they're getting used to being a little more distant from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be a useful, useful practice. 
especially since it would be so easy for anybody who's still working at home, working remotely, to just start thinking proactively about, about creating a little bit of, no pun intended, social distance with their dog. And, and don't do that too long. I'm not saying ignore your dog for the whole day, but create these opportunities to have these, these dry runs of, of slightly more separation from the dog. And I feel like that may be naturally happening as people are working and they've had to they're forced into it. Like I have to work. You need to be quiet over there by yourself. Here's mm -hmm. a chewy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Absolutely. But uh, there, that's a double-edged sword because dogs are, I think all, uh, I suspect over the past year, year and a half, most of our pet dogs have gotten used to being ignored a little more in the sense that they get a lot more time with their owner presence, but a lot less portion of that time is interaction. So, you know, what back when people worked nine to fives, uh, the, they might only be home with their dog for, you know, excluding sleeping time. They might only have like four or five hours when they're present with their dog, but a fair portion of that would actually be actively interacting with them. Now we have the whole day with our dog and we're ignoring them most of the time. So they are getting used to the lack of interaction, but it's a double-edged sword as there's a lack of interaction, but there's still the, the presence. Uh, and for example, right now, my dog, he's very happy not interacting with me, but he is sitting right at my feet. Uh, and if I were not here, he couldn't sit at my feet. Uh, and so we want, we want to start transitioning from lack of interaction sitting at our feet to lack of interaction sitting five feet from us, lack of interaction sitting 10 feet from us, and so on and so forth, until the dogs are, are again reassured and comfortable that a lack of interaction at 50 feet doesn't mean you're never coming back and doesn't mean you're not going to have the quality interactions at some point in that day. Yeah, so more transitioning to your absence from the home and then when you are there, now you're interacting with your dog mm -hmm. versus the opposite, which is what <laughs> we have going on now sometimes. And so what do you say to people, <clears throat> and I'm just thinking of a particular person that I'm working with now, who want who leaves music on for the dog but she doesn't want it on when she's home <laughs> so how do you address something like that I, i'd be curious well I, i'd be curious why she wants the music on for her dog uh well, I'm, I'm not that curious i suspect i know the answer she she expects that it's going to help the dog uh and i, I don't I don't, I'm actually rather confident there's no evidence that it will help. Uh, we're starting to get inklings of evidence that that is actually probably counterproductive and not, not tragically. So, and I don't, I wouldn't be too confrontational because I, I think it's a very good idea. There's a sound thinking behind, sound thinking <laughs> behind that, uh, but it's probably not the right way for the dog. So I would suggest two things. The ideal, I think, would be, and I actually want to talk about music a little more in a minute, but the ideal would be for her to play that music at least periodically while she's home. Uh, and it could be at a low volume, you know, play it in one room of the house. If she's in a, if she doesn't really want to hear the music, she can be in a different area of the house, but have the music playing there periodically throughout the day while she's present. Uh, and so then that, then it becomes a more consistent signal. If, she, if the dog owner really isn't going to do that, then I'd say leave the music off while you're away, again, to maintain consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little bit of a tangent, but to go on the tangent of music, there have recently been a lot of, uh, well, several collections of music made for dogs, particularly. Uh, and I will admit to being very skeptical of these when, when I first learned of them. Uh, but, the, but as I've looked into it, there is some data showing that these really are useful and very beneficial for dogs. And they've actually collected the, the right types of music. Uh, and it's not so much genres. You know, lots of people would always say, you used to say classical music would be best. And there is some truth to that, but it's not about the genre. It's about some of the characteristics of the kind of, uh, this is a little, quite outside my field. I've read a little bit of it, but there are characteristics relating to the melody and the tempo of it uh, and kind of the more simple melodies uh, are more beneficial. And you often see that in classical music, but be careful about assuming that you'll see that in classical music. Because if you put on uh whatever the the classical music station is they'll have a lot of music that is classical music but doesn't fit those criteria it you know the more intense uh more upbeat more kind of 
dramatic or, or, or suspense building classical music, that's probably not going to be as beneficial. So really look towards the quality collection made for dogs. There's one that I really like uh, called Through a Dog's Ear. Uh, there's, you know, CDs or albums or cricket, you know, people download now, people don't play CDs anymore, uh, but you can get all of these on, on Amazon or I think they're, they have their own website. Uh, and I, I've actually found I like it quite, so I'll play it for my dog and I'm, like, I'm relaxed. Uh, so it's, it's a good collection. I know when I was a zookeeper, we had this room full of birds, exotic birds screaming all the time. And think of like 60 birds in a room that just are loud. The only thing that quieted them all down was classical music. And I'm not saying birds and dogs are exactly the same, but it was that was the first thing I noticed about the music was, huh, they were literally silent when that music was on. Now, a bird obviously is a little simpler than a dog in some ways. And it could have been just something unusual to them. You know, I don't know, but it was, it was the first thing that kind of showed me, oh, music might have something there. Mm -hmm. And we also had through a dog's ear playing for our old dog who was sound sensitive and we called mm -hmm. it Maddie's song. <laughs> we knew it by heart <laughs> and it did calm her in addition to other things we were doing. So I always say it's not the band-aid you're looking for, but mm -hmm. It, it's a tool. Yeah, it's like uh, I don't know, like chamomile tea for us. And if you've got an anxiety disorder, you, you, that's not going to do it. You need to see a therapist and get the right treatments. But if you're just having an off day, or you know, that can be a, an adjunct, it can be helpful. Uh, yeah. I, there was something else I was thinking about music, uh, but before I come back to it, I just had to laugh because uh, there was uh, research a while back. I don't remember who did this. But as they, they were studying, they were working with rats and playing them different music. And I forget exactly how they were assessing whether the rats liked it, but they actually had a, a pretty interesting method. Uh, and it turned out I was very happy with the results. The rats did not enjoy country music, but they liked heavy metal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> how, I want to know how a rat shows how he likes music. <laughs> they were headbanging. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so I actually want to revisit the idea of being careful with just going to like a, a, a collection of classical music or a classical music channel because they will have other things or uh, they will have, uh, you know, the, the, the advertisements or other things that might have different sound profiles. Although there is a running joke, I believe, on, on PBS. What do, what do they say? The, 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 the station for dogs, dogs or something like that, they'll, they'll make that joke quite often. Oh, yeah. uh, and I, I think, you know, that's probably better than, than to, it's better than nothing if your dog, if you want something playing, but again, remember the idea of consistency, not distraction. Uh, so certainly PBS or your random classical music station played at a nice little volume is, is probably okay. But if you're really thinking about playing sound and or music for your dog i'd really take the time to just invest in something like through a dog's ear it's it's cheap easy and it, it it's really good quality yeah yeah i've seen <clears throat> good results with our old sound sensitive dog mm -hmm. she would also lie in front of a fan that was on high speed and put her face right up against it and lie there with her thunder shirt on and she was totally content with those things happening, you know, mm -hmm. whether it just, she needed to block out the noise that was causing her anxiety. <laughs> and there, there is a fair bit of overlap, I believe, between separation anxiety and, and noise sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's also overlap in some of the treatments is it, separation anxiety. Certainly, if you have a dog that is sensitive to sound or noises, the separation anxiety will certainly be exacerbated by that in the sense that if you leave them alone and they're kind of they're, they're okay but they're just you know they're 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 what we would say below threshold but they're not having the best day of their life and then there's a loud noise you know the thunder clap outside like, like we had some doozies this morning that will not only set off their sound sensitivity but now they're that will probably put them over threshold for their separation as well uh, and i think we alluded to that in a previous video about how you you can try to control everything but then suddenly when there's construction across the street it's going to set you back and you're going to, you know, if, if you can 
if you can be aware of any changes in the environment that are coming, make sure you incorporate that into your treatment. For example, today uh, we have wild thunderstorms. Really, we we're talking earlier about how they they just shook our houses. They were pretty intense. Uh, and if I were working with a separation anxiety dog today, I would most likely take the day off. Uh, if we we're doing practice separations or these 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 brief separations, I'd say let's just not even do it today. Or if we were to do it, I would aim for much much shorter separations to be to to account for the fact that the dog's threshold is almost certainly going to be lower on a, a noisy thunderstorm day. You think it would help to have a, a familiar person that the dog likes to visit the dog during the day if you were gone for a long period? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, and that actually raises a question about there's, uh, I, I steer clear of the terminology, but there is uh, there are some definitions of terminology between separation anxiety and I believe isolation distress is the, the, the differentiation. And in true separation, I, I believe, I hope I'm getting this right and not getting them backwards, but in one of them, I believe it's true separation anxiety. The issue is really being separated from the primary caretaker. So that would likely be mom or dad or you know whoever. Uh, and the, what that means is if that person is gone, the dog is likely to go into a panic mode or be very anxious, even if there are other friendly, familiar people there. So the issue is really the lack of that, that primary caretaker. That I believe is actually fairly rare in dogs. Most mm -hmm. dogs that we talk about as having quote unquote separation anxiety really have isolation distress where it's the, the problem is that they are alone without any comfortable human familiar interaction, familiar human interaction. Uh, so that, that visitor in the, the day, that'd be very good for most of the dogs that have that isolation distress. Uh, but also keep in mind that is if you have a visitor coming, if you're doing measured, uh, uh, measured absences, if you're working on that desensitization, that visitor coming means that absence was, you know, so if you're, if let's say you're doing a, a one hour long absence, that's kind of your, your dog's threshold might be a bit longer than an hour and you're practicing at around one hour absence and you have somebody come in at half an hour to visit. Well, you just did half hour visit, even if you, the primary caregiver, was gone for an hour. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I've, I think you're right. I rarely see a dog that does not relax when a familiar person visits. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, maybe true separation anxiety is more rare than we think. And that's kind of semantics. I'm not sure if everybody defines separation anxiety that strictly. Well, actually, I know not everybody defines separation anxiety <laughs> that strictly. Uh, yeah. I'm ambivalent on whether we even should define separation anxiety that strictly. But forgetting the terms, there certainly are two, two varieties of distress. One is selective to when their primary caregiver is gone versus being uncomfortable with just being alone, which is far more common. Yeah, I think we just need to throw out some language sometimes and <laughs> just erase it from our minds and start over. <laughs> okay, so um, what can we, let's see, we talked about setting up the environment, doing mock departures. So what would you suggest for someone who's now, they've prepared their dog as best they can for leaving and going back to work? Um, how would you suggest now that they set up their home? and get ready to leave for the first day back to work. Oh, I, I don't have any strong views on, on a general advice for that. I think that's gonna vary quite a bit case by case. Uh, and this just goes back to like the, the topic of crating versus not crating. More often than not, crating is not gonna be helpful, but in some dogs it really is. And so you've gotta know which, which one, which category is your dog in. Uh, so making sure that certainly making sure the environment's comfortable, uh, be careful of some of the things that, that, you know, I, I'm very, I'm very, uh, motivated to, to help the environment and to use energy efficiently, but we can't crank down our thermostats or change them drastically during the day because we're not there when our dog is still there. Uh, so if you're, if you wouldn't be comfortable in the home without the air conditioner running, leave the air conditioning running while you're away. Um. Uh, so, you know, just keep the environment comfortable, uh, consistent. Uh, I think the, and I've been harping on this, so I'm kind of a broken record, but consistency is probably the one thing that, that would apply to 
pretty much all dogs, if not all dogs, is keep the environment very similar when you're away as to when you're there. Uh, whether a dog likes the music or not, that will likely vary by individual. Whether they like the crate or not, that's going to vary by individual. But most of them don't. We'll just say that it falls more on that side. Uh, yeah. I think, okay, so let me get your opinion on this. I've been a big fan of ignoring my dog when I leave. I drop his chewy, I walk out the door, I don't say goodbye. When I come in, I don't make a big deal. I think that goes back to not creating another departure cue. Do you feel like there's, do you see any benefit from either way, saying goodbye or not saying goodbye? <laughs> My views on that are kind of in a transitional state. Uh, and a lot of that has been influenced by that, the research by uh, Molina De Martini Price, whose book I, I highlighted last time uh and she has I, when, I love her writing she just lays it out so clearly and in such a way that once you read it, it's like well that was obvious but I was doing something else all along uh, and one of the, the points she makes about departure cues is I, I used to spend a lot of time kind of desensitize excuse me desensitizing each departure cue and trying to get rid of them you're never going to get rid of them they're always going to be there. Uh, and even the ones we know about are always going to be there. And then we're going to miss lots of them. We're never going to pick up on all the cues that our dogs are picking up on. So instead of trying to prevent them, we should use them. And we, we do desensitize the dog to those departure cues. So for example, your first, uh, your first departures, your for, first brief uh, uh, isolation, that's a horrible word, your first brief alone times when you leave the dog for a couple minutes and come back, you keep it as simple as possible so that in those first ones, you don't, maybe you don't even put on your shoes, you don't grab your keys, you don't grab your coat, you just go out, you come back in. Uh, and then kind of randomly you mix it up so sometimes you'll grab your keys and go out and come back in. Sometimes you'll put on your shoes, go out, come back in. Sometimes you'll get shoes and keys. And so you want a lot of kind of random variation in that, but you don't want to it, you don't want to try to get rid of those factors. And I think the way she presents it in her book is you don't want to lie to your dog as we don't want to try to trick them. We're not going to trick them. Uh, they know we're gone. It's not like it's not like not refusing to say goodbye to them is going to make them think, oh, maybe he's not actually leaving. Uh, so I'm all for saying goodbye because it, it's like almost a, a reassurance. Well, you can use it as a reassurance and it can actually be a consistent cue that I'm coming back. So I'm saying goodbye, I'm coming back. Every time I say goodbye, I come back. Um, I don't know if that actually helps, but I am I am getting more convinced that the ignoring probably doesn't help. So if if you know from my point of view, if you have ignoring the dog might not help, saying goodbye may not help. And I really would like to say goodbye. So I'm just gonna do that. Uh, and this uh, goes hand in hand with uh, and We'll, we'll, I'll come back to whether this applies to separation distress or isolation distress, but there are some some things out there, some advice out there that I, I will unequivocally say is just silly bad advice uh, about various behavior problems in dogs coming from, you know, dominance or whatnot, the dog thinking they have a certain role in the family, and some advice occasionally is given that when you come home, you should, uh, putting aside separation issues, when you come home, you shouldn't greet your dog right away. You should totally ignore them for a while so that they know that they don't, that they aren't in charge and they don't get to say when to interact. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time even presenting that point of view with a straight face. It's just silly. But I've worked with a lot of clients who've been told that. And, and for, so for example, one of my clients with aggression issues, he came home and he ignored his dog for 15 minutes every day when he came home. And the dog was just like, why are you ignoring me? Mm -hmm. He was, the owner was doing that because he thought that was important to establish the quote unquote pack order. When I told him that, no, that's, that's nonsense. There's no reason for that. Uh, and I said, go ahead and greet your dog when you come home. His, like the, the look of relief on his face. Yeah. Was amazing. He's like, really? I can, I can love on my dog again. I'm like, yes, please love on your dog. So in those contexts, I'm absolutely confident that the, ignoring them when you come back is, is nonsense and is just even potentially hurtful to the relationship. In the case of separation anxiety or isolation distress, I can't say I'm 100% confident that ignoring them when you come home might not have some benefit, 
but I've not actually seen evidence that it does. Uh, and so I'm pretty skeptical. And so my, my uh, conditional advice would be, yeah, when you come home, greet your dog like you, however you would like to. Yeah, I think thinking about what you're saying, I feel like where I've seen a person coming home and greeting their dog and the dog becoming more anxious mm -hmm. is when they're overly greeting their dog and they're getting revved up and the dog's getting revved up. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's what most people do, though. I think they just want to say hi to their dog and then put their stuff down and do a few things, you know. Yeah. So I think what most people are doing is probably correct. Yeah, I think that absolutely makes sense. And I was actually thinking about that shortly after I answered. Is you don't want to make a scene. You don't want to make, because the, the departure and arrival are, are the kind of critical points. And you don't want to accentuate them more than they already are. Uh, but you could actually argue both ways. So first, I will say you don't want to accentuate them more than you already are. But following the logic that you don't want to lie to your dog, you don't also want to, you don't want to pretend that they aren't there. I mean, these are real events, the departure and the arrival, uh, and they can be treated as such, uh, but you don't want to accentuate them. However, ignoring your dog, like deliberately or, or con conspicuously, and that word is quite apt, conspicuously ignoring your dog makes it more of an event, is that you come home, your dog is happy to see you, and now you're ignoring them, and the dog goes, why are you ignoring me? And now it really it punctuates that that arrival event versus just coming in and naturally saying hello and loving on your dog however you normally would mm -hmm. and i i feel like too people are going to do what they're going to do most of the time <laughs> and we're not going to trick our dogs they know way more than we do they pick up on things we can't even think of <laughs> so i think you're right it's just don't make a scene just be normal and don't make a scene yeah. And I think keeping it, so you just touched on something that people are going to do what they're going to do. That's also valuable mentality in working with separation anxiety or, or clients with separation anxiety dogs. Is I don't want to say pick your battles, because if something actually is useful, have the client do that. But don't have them do things that we aren't confident are useful. Because every new thing that we we tell a dog owner to do when they're working with separation anxiety is just yet another burden and the biggest hurdle to progress in separation anxiety the biggest hurdle to actually getting to solutions is owner commitment uh, uh, and that's maybe true of most behavior issues but it's very potently true for separation anxiety is i, I don't want to give the wrong impression you can make progress with separation anxiety and dogs with separation anxiety have been essentially cured or fixed in a, a moderately reasonable portion of the time frame. But it's not easy. I mean, it takes work uh, and it sometimes can be discouraging work. It can take a lot of investment from the dog owner, uh, both time and emotional investment. And we need to be aware of that emotional investment. And so every new thing that we throw at them, and if they're already having a big emotional investment and they're doing a lot with this, and we say, and when you come home, don't greet your dog like you'd like to. Like, oh, right. that's, just, that's just salt in the wound at that point. And so that's why even, even if we don't have solid data that it's harmful or helpful, in the absence of really good data that that's an important part of the treatment plan, I'd say no let the owners love on their dog let them maintain that relationship let them get some some joy out of a, a situation that is very challenging yeah i think you know like i've said before the house has to be on fire for people to call for help mm -hmm. they're calling for help we don't need to add more fuel to the fire <laughs> let's take some burdens away and uh, and definitely pick the battles in terms of the one battle you should pick one thing right Calling it a battle is probably the wrong mentality. I want right. to I need a different phrase. But the one the one issue that that you really should focus on uh, with a owner of a separation anxiety dog is the commitment to not leave the dog alone longer than the dog can handle. And that is, is that is that is the most important point. And that's where you need to bring in outside help. You need to bring in the village, the dog sitters, the neighbors, the family members. Uh, because even I was talking to a client uh, the other day. Uh, where we're not actually focusing on separation anxiety, but they just, uh, since they've been home, like many people, they've realized that their dog might have separation issues. And they've actually started trying trial departures and realized that, yes, there seems to be an issue. 
uh, and they had the mentality that, well, uh, I'll leave for a short time and then come back when my dog quiets down. Mm. No, 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 no. If your dog's already amped up, don't, don't wait for them to quiet down. You've already missed the, the time period that you should have come back at. You need to come back while they're below threshold. If the dog's already past threshold, call it off the phone. There's nothing productive that's going to happen at that point. Minimize the, the, the emotional damage and just go back in. Uh, and I guess we didn't even touch on that. I don't believe it's possible to reinforce those those behaviors. So say you leave for a short time and you screw up, it happens. So don't don't kick yourself if you realize that you push your dog past threshold. We right. all do it. This happens. But the question is, what do you do in that moment? Uh, if the dog is inside panicking, scratching at the door, whining, howling, do not have the mentality of, oh, I don't want to go in now and reward that behavior. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense, uh, quite literally, because you cannot reward, you can neither reward nor punish behaviors that are emotionally motivated. They're not amenable to consequence-based learning. Uh, so with a lot of my clients, I use the, the cliche that people have heard, uh, the beatings will continue until morale improves. You can't punish somebody for feeling bad and make them feel better. The corollary to that is, you don't have to worry about accidentally rewarding somebody for feeling bad and making them feel worse. And when I have a really bad day, coming home and having somebody say something nice to me does not make me more likely to have a bad day, uh, just the opposite. So if your dog is, and this is a bit of a tangent from where we're going, but I think it's an important point. If your dog is panicking, if your dog is having an issue, go back to them right away. Uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing gained by letting them fester in that panic state longer. Yeah, that's such an important point. I call being over threshold of being in the emotional brain, like you said. And I, I tell people, you know, if you're having a panic attack, you're not going to be able to do math problems. You know, like you can't do both. You, you need to calm down first. So let's give your dog a chance to relax first and then go back to learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so then what can we... Um, is there anything else we can do to help prepare our dogs for this leaving? I think you've covered everything we could think of. I <laughs> uh, just want to make sure we didn't miss anything. Oh, I'm sure we have missed a lot of things, but none, none that I know. There, there is, there are actually all, quite a lot of people with, who are really invested in treating separation anxiety and doing a lot of really good research on it. We're, we're all kind of in this, uh, this, this, what's the, the term, the for planes flying around the air, airline, the holding pattern. Uh, or there's lots of speculation about what might happen as people go back to work, but it's all speculation. We don't know. I mean, this, the, there, there's, there's this both excitement and, and uh, tension uh, that we, we know that within the next maybe six months to a year, we're going to have a lot of data about how this pandemic either did or did not create dogs with separation anxiety but right now we don't know uh the data has yet to come in uh it, it's very intuitive to to look at it and say yes uh now that we've been home with our dogs all this time they're, they're likely to have problems with us leaving and i've said that but we don't actually know that for a fact we could be totally wrong and our dogs might bounce back just fine now not that's not the dogs that actually would have had separation anxiety otherwise but your dogs that didn't have separation anxiety before the pandemic might bounce back just fine when we leave. Mm -hmm. So we want to set them up to have the best chance of doing that, but we also shouldn't panic. And we, I, I think, I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to stress ourselves about leaving our dogs alone because our dogs pick up on our emotional state. Mm -hmm. If we're leaving the house to go back to work for the first time, we're like, oh boy, what's going to happen to the dog? That's a departure cue, and it's a different one than the dog has ever seen before. Uh, and that is probably setting them up for failure. Is the dog thinking, why is dad panicking when he's leaving? He's never panicked when he left before. This can't be good. Uh, so we don't want to, we don't want to do that. We, we want to keep it as neutral as possible. Yeah. And then the other side is that I find, I don't know how you feel about this. Dogs are fairly adaptable. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I with a lot of my, so again, many of my clients I'm working on aggression issues. 
Uh, and I always like to highlight there's actually Jean Donaldson is a, a phenomenal dog behaviorist and she's she ran a, a school for dog trainers, she writes lots of wonderful books. In almost every one of her books that I've seen, there's an introductory section often somewhere called something along the lines of acknowledging the bar, acknowledging the bar that we're setting for our dogs. So her goal is often to talk about realistic expectations. Like if a dog is growling, we shouldn't necessarily worry about that. It might be perfectly reasonable for them to growl in those contexts. But we also, I also look at that from another angle where uh, people get, people with dogs with some sort of tension, reactivity or aggression often feel, feel well, all sorts of things. They feel like they, they may have done something wrong. They feel like their dog might be bad. And the truth is that 99% of dogs who don't have those issues, it's not that those 99% are normal. It's that those 99% are phenomenal. When you look at what we do to our dogs, mm -hmm. how adaptable they really have to be to live in our world, is it's really amazing. Uh, and so I'll often talk to clients about the way most humans approach a dog. You think about the typical way the average human being approaches a, a dog they've never met. They walk straight into them, which that's a bit of an aggressive or threatening gesture. They'll look right at them, often making eye contact, which is threatening. They'll lean over them, looming over them. This is especially true for the chihuahuas and little dogs. They do a lot of this. Uh, being looming over them is, is threatening. And then we'll take these things, our hands, which dogs know two things about our hands. They move around and are really unpredictable and they are our primary weapon. So we take our primary weapons and we launch them right at their face. And when you think about that, the fact that humans are not, that every human dog interaction doesn't end in a bite just is, is amazing. And that's practically a miracle that we're not all getting bitten every single day. Uh, so that highlights the adaptability and the patience of dogs. Uh, the fact that, you know, some portion of dogs are slightly less mi miraculously tolerant of that nonsense is not a, is not a detractor from those dogs. They might actually be the slightly more sane ones. Uh, they have a little bit more of a realistic expectation of humans. Uh, That's so perfect, perfect description. <laughs> but going back to the context of separation anxiety, it's, it's also worth noting that how, how social dogs are and how, uh, how I hate you ever using the word pack because pack mentality is just misused in so many ways, but they are animals that live in, in tight, cohesive groups. Uh, and we are part of their family. We, we are kind of part of their cohesive group. So when we leave, that is quite rightfully stressful and challenging to them. That is something that, again, a vast portion of dogs cope with very well, but it it is realistic for that to be a stressor. So when your dog is not coping with that well, that's not a pathology, that's, that's normal. I mean, that's, that's, that's what, and we wanna help them with it. We wanna help them get through that, but that is not a pathology. That is, that is a healthy response to that circumstance. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I always say dogs don't bite as much as they should. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, boy, if I were a dog, people would be getting mauled every day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I've literally grabbed my clients by the shoulders and said, how does that feel? And stare in their face. I'm like, that's what you're doing to your dog. <laughs> but our dogs don't mind it from us because they're used to us. They're more trusting of us. We've had a, a history with them, you know. Yes, yes and no. I mean, uh, I think our own dog, any person's dog is much more tolerant of that person than they would be of others mm -hmm. uh, because they've, they've learned through experience that the stupid things we do are not actually a threat. It doesn't make them any more comfortable. And oh, that's true, good there's, point. There's, there's some, some research, which I always take with a grain of salt about, uh, that they've assessed you know, all the silly photos that people put on social media of them and their dogs and hugging their dogs. And they look for all the stress signs in those dogs or all the signs in, in the dog's expressions or body posture that show that the dogs are actually very uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true. Uh, however, I, I think some people overstate that research. Dogs do like to cuddle and they like to do it on their terms and there are some limitations. Uh, so we should never assume that they like to cuddle and hug as much or in the same way as we do, but they do like to, to cuddle and interact. Uh, kind of going off on a tangent, but just yeah. because our, just because your dog tolerates and accepts <laughs> all that, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and and they, they do certainly recognize it as a sign of affection. So I, I'm just kind of anthropomorphizing or putting myself in the sh in dog's shoes. They don't wear shoes. <laughs> putting myself in the, the dog's position. I suspect they know very well that, oh, yeah, dad's trying to show affection. What a big idiot. Uh, so they, they tolerate it because they know what it means. Mm -hmm. But they still may not love it as, as much as we think. Yeah. Yeah, we have a dog who does not like hugs. He will tolerate it most from me, but I know where his limit is <laughs> and I don't push him to that. <laughs> so he's comfortable being next to me, maybe touching, maybe not, but that's just him, you know? He's an independent nor Northern breed, you know, a Jindo Husky, they're more independent. They they're not as cuddly sometimes, and that's just him. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is important. It's so important to know your dog and to understand, to build that relationship so that they are as comfortable as they can be. And then when you go back to work and leave your dog and, you know, just be you, they're already used to that. And if <laughs> your dog has anxiety issues, work on it as much as you can, set them up to succeed as much as possible, and then... Just be you and greet your dog when you come home. <laughs> okay, Jesse, well, um, anything else on this one? I think we've covered a lot. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I hope that's helpful to people. Uh, and uh, I, I should give the huge caveat or disclaimer that all this information uh, I hope is useful, uh, but it is almost certainly not adequate to just go deal with your own separation anxiety dog without help. Uh, there, find a, a, if you can find a certified separation anxiety trainer or find any qualified uh, positive reinforcement or fear free, however you, they advertise themselves, a dog trainer who uses quality approaches to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that even in the context of if, I, if my dog had separation anxiety, I'd want somebody else to help because I can know the science, I can know the process, but we are too invested and we have we have, we are we have blinders when it comes to our own pets uh so it's just like you know a psychologist if they are having trouble in the workplace or wherever in a relationship they'll go to another psychologist to help them they're not going to try to figure out their own situation even though they have the the, the knowledge and the background to do so it's just not going to work well yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for doing this. This has been fantastic. And of course, we'll put links to your information in the description. And if you guys have questions about anxiety issues or aggression issues, contact Jesse. If you're in the St. Louis area, he can help you. And even Illinois, I think you go to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Southern Eastern Missouri, Southern Illinois, we'll say. <laughs> yeah, St. Louis, St. Charles County, certainly the entire St. Louis, St. Charles counties, and then sometimes uh, outlying areas. Yeah, great. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun and uh, interesting to talk about. Great. Well, thanks so much, Jesse. Hopefully we can have you back on someday. <laughs> great. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.